And then you uh, un unshare for Matt. It, it, uh, it, Hello, I'm Mike Douglas, and this is the CMSA New Technologies and Mathematics Seminar. And today we're delighted to have uh, Gabriel Poesia from the Stanford Department of uh, Computer Science, who will tell us about uh, Piano, a system for learning formal mathematical reasoning without human data. So uh, as I always do, I'll offer to uh, watch uh, if you have questions you would like uh, evaluated, I'll watch the chat and uh, ask them or encourage you to ask them. And uh, Gabriel's happy to have questions during the talk. And uh, we'll leave a few minutes at the end for a uh, discussion. So uh, with that, uh, Gabriel, please. Unmute and Right. Um, okay, good. Yeah, hey everyone. I'm Gabriel. I'm a PhD student in computer science at Stanford, working with Noah Goodman. And I'll be talking about a line of work that we've been pursuing for the last two years already on learning math formal mathematics, kind of starting from, from the axioms and, and problems by themselves. Um, so yeah, happy to answer questions like during and, and certainly after the presentation. Yeah, so we'll, we'll start with just the observation that game playing AI has really made tremendous progress in the last 10 years. We saw the first agents being able to play Atari by basically interacting with, with the games themselves, with pixels and like choosing actions and, and seeing rewards. Um, that eventually led to, to agents playing board games like, like Go with AlphaGo being the first really good player, um, really good AI at this game. And it started by learning from human games, but then improved itself through self-play. And that uh, progressed to even uh, cutting off the, the dependency and starting with human games by themselves. So we could even just start with the rules of the game and by playing against itself, um, Alpha Zero was, was able to achieve even higher performance. And AlphaGo was notable for a lot of reasons. One of them was that it also became a Netflix documentary. So the algorithm made, made it through to Netflix. Um, but this, this progress in, in game playing AI, which was really one of the, the core problems in, in AI for decades, has also made a lot of people wonder of what would be the equivalent for that in, in mathematics, of this game of mathematics. So how, how could that game um, look like? And in recent years, one formulation of this game in computers that became very popular and, and successful in, in um, a range of domains was the setting of interactive theorem provers, where we have one, for example, uh, Lean, which is a system where you can state a background theory. I can define natural numbers, for example, and the operation of addition. And then I can state a theorem which serves as kind of an initial board configuration. And as I play this game by inputting actions into, into the system, the, the board, which here is represented as the state on the right uh, is updated. And I have a notion of a reward, right? When I prove the theorem, I win the game in a certain sense. But this analogy to board games in this particular setting of interactive theorem proving breaks down a little bit in in, in a few edges. And one of them is in the action space. Right? So in this formulation where I'm uh, typing tactics into Lean, there is an infinite number of possible valid lines that I could type. Not even infinite number of proofs, of course, but but even like max moves that I can play in this game. Um, this is not really a problem per se if I learn to generate these actions from human data. So I can look at proofs that people have written, um, train some sort of generative model on them, like a language model, or in previous versions, a model that would like choose derivations in a in a grammar, for example, to produce a term. And, and from that, 
from that model, we can gen, um, generate and, and try out actions in this game. And this line of work has been quite prolific. There, there, there's been a lot of work building on, on this analogy and paradigm of pre-training on, on human fruits, and then sometimes improving um, with by, by playing the game in, in a reinforcement learning setting. And more recently, this um, this paradigm of training language models specifically on human proofs also has the perhaps appealing advantage of being able to also ingest kind of more informal um, training data. Right? So it can train on archive, uh, on the web, on all sorts of you know, natural language uh, solutions to, to similar problems, and then leverage that in, even in formal human proofing. And even though you do have to start with training from data from the existing domains, we, we started to play with and see some generalization to, to even new definitions and, and premises. So um, two great talks that were here in the center in the past weeks of uh, on Lindo Joe that Alex gave and, and Sean on, on Lemo and this little demo on LLM step that was able to like show, to use a, a definition that was new to the model, like just in, in context, for example, or some examples of this sort of generalization that's that we're starting to play with. But this line of work that ended up in Alpha Zero made a very bold proposal of being able to set up a game with its base rules and learn to play the game well. And there's a it, it's, it's there's a very large gap between just the rules of the game that's in chess, for example, that tell you that you can move pawns and 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 knights in a certain way, and the insights that you want to be able to to dominate the center, for example, right? And like in a general, um, as a general principle of, of the game. And that's in the open, you should strive for some things. Those are not set in the rules at all. Right? There, there's a very large gap between knowing the rules and doing how to play at a higher level. And in the game of mathematics, there is a lot of information just contained in the, the specific axioms and definitions and problems that we choose, right? Like we choose those for a reason. And in, in a sense, they say a lot already about the structure of the game, even before we see um, like solutions using them. So one line of, of, of work that I've been pursuing is how, how can you extract that information from just those definitions, so just the problems and, and the actions by themselves. And there has been some, um, some other uh, previous works on learning to prove theorems kind of starting from scratch as well. Starting from scratch, we mean like in a, an environment that implements a sort of game and um, has a, a finite action space. And we, we've seen this working, for example, in classical first order logic with the, uh, this first nearest paper and also tactic zero more recently in a, in a restricted set of, of tactics in, in Hall 4. And, and, and this shows that there is promise also in learning to play this game if we set up the game in a in a setting that allows for, for that. Um, on a very interesting, uh, still more theoretical side, there is uh, the work on Math Zero by David McAllister, which also tries to set up a, a game based on um, just on, on dependent type theory. And this is what we'll strive to also do here, um, to set up a general a game in a higher order system with a, a finite set of actions so that we can start to play this game even with a kind of a naive agent. And just as a yeah so so the main insight to kind of reduce this action space from infinite to finite will be to notice that this interaction mode of typing tactics in, into an interactive thing prover was designed for people to play this game right? for, for human players in a certain sense. And humans have no problems at all with having to consider like an infinite set of, of actions. That's just not a thing. Um, but for an agent that's starting from scratch, that, that does become a problem. And the main issue is that in kind of one step, I can build arbitrarily complex terms to, to input as arguments to tactics um, or, or functions. So one simple idea that we'll explore here will be to basically break down deep constructions that I might want to input into a series of small actions that kind of build that uh, layer by layer. Um, there's this very old 
idea in Copilot for functional languages called the inner form, so functional programs, which are basically a way to express like a potentially deep uh, lambda term in terms of terms that only kind of add one function application uh, to the previous ones. So that we can break up you know, the infinite set of complex terms into a set of small decisions. Um, and just to make sure that there's nothing deep going on here, like making a finite action space for math in a you know, kind of fundamental sense, because um, this sounds like it might be a dangerous move. Um, but just making it finite is not necessarily a, a big deal. So for example, here's a, a trivial finite action space game for math. It's called the keyboard. And the states of this game are strings. And we start with the empty string. And then the actions are the finitely many keys that we have. Each of them appends a, a new character to the string. And then there's a special action, maybe we call it enter, that submits the current proof to Lean, for example. Right? And then we get a reward if Lean accepts it as a proof of the theorem. So in, in principle, that's a finite action space where I can play this game. Um, and a slightly better version of this could be based on, on the grammar, maybe like to restrict it to generate at least syntactically valid terms. Um, so, so this is just true to argue that the main challenge is not necessarily just making the game finite, but at the same time, making it dense enough to bootstrap from a, a naive agent. So like the, the problem with this formulation of the game would be that if we start kind of playing random actions, we wouldn't even prove the, the simplest theorems that would only need like reflexivity, for example. Even that string would be super hard to generate. Um, yeah, so just an overview of what I'll talk about here. Um, I'll describe Piano, which is a minimal theorem proving language with a finite action space where we can set up this game. We will showcase study using that to solve problems from Khan Academy, uh, like a progression of algebra problems. Uh, we'll first try reinforcement learning, see that that has a limit that will be overcome by also learning uh, abstractions or learning tactics uh, on the go. And then we'll move to a setting where we don't actually have that dense of a curriculum to, to work with. So we have uh, we'll work with the natural number game, which is a very popular game used to introduce lean. It's really fun, I recommend it. Um, and I'll talk about some ongoing work on, on trying to solve that. Yeah. So, our game of mathematics here will be based on a like one of the simplest dependent type theories that are enough to represent what we want here, the covered level constructions, this version of with normal types on the left. And in this formulation, um, we'll have objects that can either represent traditional mathematical objects like natural number, um, but also evidence for certain propositions, like a hypothesis of a theorem or a proof when, when I finish constructing one. Um, so we've we, we been working with objects that serve these two purposes. And a state in this game will consist of a set of objects that I've constructed or that I received right, from, from, for example, the hypothesis of a theory. And optionally, we might have a goal um, that's embedded in the state, which will usually be a type of, of that represents the proposition that I'm trying to prove. Um, our background theory just like in Lean, can define some base types and axioms that will be, be used to enumerate actions for this game. Um, they usually have function types, dependent function types, so we take some inputs and produce some output. And we have three basic kinds of actions. So we have forward actions, which take something from the state. So if my state has some objects, I can use one of the axioms from, from the theory to construct a new object, or an axiom or a constructor, those two are formally the same in this case. And, and my goal remains unchanged. Um, now, if I construct a thing that, uh, an object that has the, the, the goal type, then of course I, I win the game. That's a winning move. Um, so this is a forward move. There's a backward move where I take something that would allow me to conclude the goal, but it might give me uh, a hypothesis that I now need to prove. So that doesn't change. Oh, sorry, there is a, yeah, that doesn't change the state, but changes the go to from G to P. Um, and it might need to, it, it might split my going to multiple goals if, if there are multiple hypotheses that I now need to prove. And besides that, there's one last move, which is instantiation, which is the equivalent of the intro tactic in, 
in most near proofers where if, if I'm trying to prove, that for example, uh, P implies G, I can assume P to, to, to then um, prove G. So that both changes the goal and the state at the same time. Yeah, okay, so we'll move forward with these three kinds of actions. And in each of these, but especially for forward and, and back productions, the environment will enumerate the choices that the agent has in, in this in this space. Right? So like in forward actions, you can choose one of the axioms and unify it with, and, and choose one of the axioms and one subset of the objects that it has that matches the, the type signature. Um, and then for backward actions, in this case, you don't need to run like higher unification, which is on the side when you do the general case, but we just use a greedy uh, heuristic, which ends up working well. And if you want, we can talk more about this in two, but if you really want to build like a complex unifier, you can also build it step by step and then and then call the backward action. But, but that's that doesn't actually show up in the national game Um yeah, so as a as a first case study, we'll try to set up a game where we formalize and solve problems from these five Khan Academy sections. Um, so these are five sections from the you can, well, from the website on um, on the path to, to algebra, where you start and just evaluating um, expressions. Um, and at this point, the student already knows how to evaluate the operations by themselves, just generalizes that to, to larger expressions, and then ends up uh, solving simple equations with, with the four operations. So we'll formalize and solve these sections, and on the way, we'll gain some insights into what a, a learner needs to, to be able to solve these problems. Um, yeah, so formalizing uh, these sections of Khan Academy is, in a certain sense, uh, straightforward. So we can just write down the axioms that the student has access to at this point when they get to this part of the of the curriculum, uh, directly in piano. Um, our states then will be a set of objects that we've constructed so far, maybe some numbers, maybe some expressions. Um, the actions will be all the way to apply th these axioms to, to those objects. For problems, um, we'll take exercises from Khan Academy, which, which have concrete numbers in them, and basically make them into templates so that we can generate exercises um, by making the constants into uh, placeholders. So, like this equation can become a template for general equations, for example. Um, and and the goal here will not really be to prove a particular proposition because that it depends a little bit on the section what what the the goal is. But we'll have a very simple checker of like did I construct an object that looks like what the section wants? So for solving an equation, for example, that's an equality between x on one side and uh, some constant on, on the other side. Um, yeah. Okay. So given this, we now have a well-defined search problem where. We have an, an, an we can sample problem from the Khan Academy curriculum, initialize uh, a state, enumerate actions, and hopefully, if we pick the right set of actions, we'll end up you know, producing a, a valid solution. So we'll get to reward. Now, even in this a very constrained setting, combinatorial search doesn't get very far. Like it's so large, it's finite, but it's so large space to just apply a breadth first search, for example. Um, so one question here would be, how can we learn from experience of solving these problems? Like maybe our agent is able to solve some problems, how should we leverage that to progress through the curriculum? Our first attempt will be to try reinforcement learning, which is a general framework that you can almost always apply, that doesn't, almost always doesn't work out of the box, but is very uh, general. And it will use one particular Method that we proposed a couple of years ago, but you, you could try other things. Um, so our goal here will be to learn a policy, which is basically um, some distribution over actions given the state that I am at, um, that hopefully will maximize uh, my expected rewards. And the main idea will be to apply expert iteration, which is we'll use some search algorithm that is parameterized by a policy, um, like beam search or MCTS. Um, and hopefully, even with a kind of a random naive search policy, um, we should be able to at least solve the, the easiest problems in the curriculum. And those problems will give us some training data that we can use to improve the policy. And after our, our policy is improved, we can go back to the problems, try to solve them again. Um, hopefully, we'll solve 
more of them and collect more training data and repeat. So this is the basic idea behind expert iteration. And here, the from, from the point of view of the agent, the states and the actions are all just strings, but the actions are coming from the formal system. So the, the, the language model in this case is not generating the actions, just having to, to, to score them. So the, all, all the actions are valid. The, the challenge is just in learning which actions are useful to, to solving the problems. Yeah, so uh, this algorithm looks like this. We can apply beam search using the policy, for example. Um, in certain cases, we'll reach a solution like x equals true uh, to solve this equation. And for the cases where we do find a solution, we can reduce policy learning to basically this problem of differentiating between the transitions that uh, walk towards the, the path to the solution and, and the alternatives that we have at this at, at, at each state. So there's a connection to, to this paradigm called uh, contrastive learning um, as a way to learn the policy here, because the action space is kind of variable. It depends on, on the state. Um, yeah, so we can just try that. And what we find is that just doing reinforcement learning is um, it gives us solutions to all the problems in the first and second sections of the curriculum. So it, it does succeed in the beginning, but it fails to make progress at all in the starting from the third section. So even though it, it does make progress, um, and, and here we're counting uh, iterations of expert iteration. So in, in each of these iterations, it samples a batch of problems, try to solve them, trains the policy, and then is evaluated on a held outside of problem. Um, and it, it is able to solve some, but, but fails to make any progress um, after a certain point. And why is that the case? Why does reinforcement learning fail here? And what we notice is that as we move from section to section on the Kanakami curriculum, and that goes beyond just the sections that we looked at, the solutions in terms of the base axioms keep getting longer and longer. Right? Like, so for the first, um, First section, all you need to do is like evaluate and substitute in a few times. Um, but then, uh, starting from the section, second section, you need to do that as a sub problem sometimes. And then to solve equations that appear as a sub problem on each side after certain transformations and so on. And this is a compounded problem uh, for this kind of agent because in piano, as we take more actions, there are more actions that become available because I construct more objects. Right? So there are more, more ways to apply the, the, the action. To, to whatever uh, Gabriel, could you show us uh, the, the, the definitions in particular, the one-step addition and one-step multiplication don't seem so different just naively. Yeah. So why, why are those so different? Yeah, so the one-step addition and multiplication are both, uh, they're both the same kind of problem in terms of complexity. Um, well, you can't do either. Yeah, you can do either. Uh, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Okay. yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, can do the, the two step. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, so, so just to, to make clear, th these problems that it is able to solve in, in both of them end up being those that they're like the, the constant they're adding is zero, for example. Okay. So like, yeah, yeah, I can't do either. It's the template. Yeah. With, yeah. Uh, or multiplying by one on one side. Yeah, so, so the search problem becomes um, kind of steadily worse as you move to more complex problems in, in, in terms of the base set of, of axioms. Right? And reinforcement learning really depends on um, kind of naively arriving at some solutions to be able to learn from those and generalize. So the probability of finding a solution to like the third section here, for example, is exponentially smaller than, than for the first and second. And, and that, um, Makes this really challenging. So just this approach of learning um, a policy and applying search alone will hit a, a clear limit here. Right? Because like if we went twenty sections uh, beyond this, we would be looking for like hundreds of of steps to solve the problem. But um, how should we do this then? This is I think will be intuitive to, to a lot of the audience, but if you look at how students are thinking about these problems, it's very clear that a student that is able to solve problems from the first two sections, which is where our, our agent stopped, and is trying to learn the, uh, how to solve their, their first equations, how would we explain how to do that? 
we would surely not say, okay, we have to apply these 10 axioms in, in succession. Uh, like that is not what we do. Um, but conceptually, what we want to be able to say is like, oh, there is a new move now that um, you have to observe that you can subtract a constant from both sides, for example. And that, yeah, is new. We haven't seen it before. But now after you do that, on the left-hand side, you get an expression with x and some constants, and you know how to combine like terms, because hopefully you, you've learned that. And then on the right-hand side, you have an expression with numbers, and you should be able to evaluate that as, as seen before. Um, so the, the insight here is that after enough experience with those simpler problems, the student really should be able to, to build higher level abstractions. Right? Like you shouldn't have to think of combining like terms as a sequence of long, uh, a long sequence of operations, but rather as like an, a new atomic ability that they have. And in, in terms of the right abstractions or at the right abstraction level, really any problem should have uh, a short solution, right? Like it's not like we start fifth grade writing four lines in each problem and then by college we're writing 10 pages for each problem. Right? Like, uh, the, the, the solution that, that we look to find, they, they kind of keep a, a certain bounded size, but of course the abstraction level raises as, as we learn. So our idea here would be to try to learn these, these abstractions. And the main, um, observation is that we can induce these abstractions by looking at the solutions found so far. Um, so we'll basically extend the base action space with a notion of tactics, which are also common in most other um, theorem proving languages. And in Piano, this will be a very simple instantiation of this, where the tactic is just a sequence of actions um, that might have some, some parameters, some free parameters. Um, and so using a tactic might apply either axioms or maybe other tactics that, that we've learned before. And just as we have the procedure to enumerate all the ways to apply a certain um, axiom, we can easily extend that to, to all the ways to apply a certain uh, tactic in the current state. And this will, in this case, basically be instantiated with anti-unification. So we have the solutions that here look like straight line programs, and we can try to find matches between um, sub-segments of those solutions. So in this case, in both cases, we have um, like a certain case of associativity and a call to a previously um, discovered tactic, and that can become a new tactic, for example. And so the idea would be basically be, which is an idea that has been successfully explored in a lot of work in, in program synthesis, uh, Dream Coder being one notable example, the idea would basically be to try to compress the existing solutions in terms of these new abstractions and choose the ones that, that compress those uh, the most. So we we can make a lot of candidates by looking at these solutions pairwise, um, compute some compression score based on the, the set of solutions that we have. Uh, and then after we decide that a certain tactic passes a certain threshold, we can rewrite the existing solutions in terms of that tactic that also gives us some initial training data for this new abstraction. Yes, so we our agent was stuck here in this third section, and we see that after the adding the ability to learn abstractions, it is able to eventually solve um, both this, but also the the next sections as well. And and then we can of course ask, like, what does these abstractions look like? Uh, these learned abstractions, um, and they, they of course form a very um, deep and long hierarchy. But if you look at the solutions written in terms of the abstractions, they do look much more human-like um, than the solutions in terms of, of, of the axioms that we, we would find, right? So for the one-step equations, for example, we do recover the solution that is taught on, on Khan Academy, where you add on both sides, and then you, like in one step, simplify one side, and the other step will simplify the other side. And the same for the two-step equations, which become two steps, but only in, the, in terms of the right abstractions. They, they do become the, the intuitive uh, two steps. But if you were to expand the axioms, you would see like 20 steps. Will you say more about your generalization or what you call anti-unification, what exactly it's doing? Yeah. Um, or maybe at the end you can... Yeah, yeah we can. Okay. Yeah. It's... Yeah, maybe we can give more detail. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and another way to look at the, to evaluate the abstractions that were found is to look at their dependencies. So the problems during training were sampled in a random order from the Khan Academy curriculum. Like the, the agent wasn't really leveraging the curriculum. Um, now, looking at the solutions to the problems, the abstractions uh, form this hierarchy that we can use to reconstruct a certain ordering between uh, using the dependencies between the tactics. So we, these dependencies uh, let us get a notion of a topological sort of the problems based on their solutions. And this, like an, an ordering of the, on the problems gives the curriculum, right? And then we can ask how, how does this recovered curriculum compare to the Khan Academy, um, the Khan Academy one. And on one hand, we see that in terms of permutation distance, this recovered curr curriculum um, is much closer to the Khan Academy one than like a random permutation. So it does have a strong correlation. And also if we plot the, the this reconstructed ordering on, on the problems, we do see a lot of the structure of Khan Academy being recovered there. Now, but even with more degrees of, of freedom that we wouldn't see in the in the, the blocks of sections. So for example, um, some problems coming from one step equations like x plus zero equals two, they can actually they only depend on one of the, the identity axioms, so they can actually come anywhere here. This problem is not actually on Khan Academy itself as a, an equation, just shows because of the, the templating process. But the recovery curriculum does um, point out that this problem actually doesn't belong there in a certain sense. And finally, for people, uh, curriculum play a very important role in accelerating learning. Right? So mathematics takes Mathematicians sometimes take centuries to, to make discoveries in a new area that are then picked up by the next generation in like a graduate level class, for example, in, in a much quicker time span. And a lot of that acceleration comes from designing a curriculum, right? So we can also ask, does our recovered curriculum serve this purpose for a second agent, for example, trained on, on that recovered already on the problems? And we see that it does in the sense that the, the second agent does learn faster, especially for the, the harder problems. Yeah, um, so I'll move to a, a last part of the, the work, which is more preliminary, but I, I think is, is, is exciting to talk about. So this previous result on being able to learn a policy and then uh, induce tactics, and it really depended on this kind of academy case on having kind of a dense covering of, of that set of problems, right? Like we have uh, a generator that could generate equations and they all kind of had the similar structure in their solutions. But when we move to proofs, uh, the curriculum suddenly becomes much sparser in the sense that if you take exercises from a textbook, for example, even between exercise and one and two, there's usually like a much larger conceptual gap between three compared to three equations from a section of Khan Academy. And we have now much less this kind of exact structural repetition that we, we relied on to, to learn tactics. So it's not as common that we apply the exact same sequence of, of moves in a certain order. Um, so one question that we've been exploring here now is like, how, how can we learn to prove theorems starting from scratch in a new domain where the theorems might come from a much sparser curriculum? And as a concrete challenge, I've been using the natural number game, which is um, a very popular game to introduce, uh, made by mathematicians and to introduce lean to mathematicians. It's it's very fun. I recommend if you haven't seen uh, it yet. And it basically consists of proving theorems starting from the bare definition of natural numbers and, and the piano axioms and, and proving um, like starting from, from basic facts about addition and multiplication up to inequalities in, in the last word. And yeah, so as, as a challenge here, uh, I, I've been taking these around 80 theorems um, from the game as, as kind of a target. And we translated it from, from the intro to piano. It was um, actually mostly done by ChatGPT. I uh, was just checking and explaining, okay, this little thing uh, is a little bit different at the end, but um, and in the setting, if we apply 
just vanilla Monte Carlo tree search, even without learning a policy, just having this reward when a sub goal um, is closed in the proof, we get a 38% success rate. Okay, we're able to start somewhere. We can learn, um, we can solve some problems. But now, um, this is without any policy learning. If we do uh, apply expert iteration in this setting, we do improve a little bit, but very little. So learning a policy here um, in this setting is not helping that much. And the challenge here is really generalization, because if we're starting from scratch, um, it's much harder to take a set of like five exercises that I was able to, to solve and, and what, what worked um, when doing search for those and generalize that to, to like a sixth problem. And this basically this reward of like, I, I was able to solve a sub goal is extremely sparse. Right? It's in this game of like 80, around 80 theorems, you would only see that maybe twice that because a lot of theorems have um, have to split into a few goals, but but that, that amount of training data is still um, uncomparable to what it would get on the web, for example. Um, so one natural question is if th this signal of like, I was able to prove the theorem is very sparse, can we learn even in the cases where we fail or, or some other uh, source of, of signal that's not being able to prove the theorem? Now, one observation is every forward action in this uh, space constructs something, it proves something or constructs a new, new object. So it, it might not, not, not be uh, what we had as a goal, but it, it is something. It didn't... We can apply one simple idea from um, reinforcement learning called the hindsight experience replay, where if I, the idea is very simple. It's, if I start with some hypothesis H and I had some goal G in mind, like a, a theorem statement that I was able to prove, and then I applied a few actions and I didn't prove G, but I proved G prime, but I could, um, I got training data for how to prove G prime from starting from age, right? So I can um, do that for the, the searches that that I performed, even if they don't, don't succeed at the original goal, and still collect some training data. Um, and yeah, so basically in a search tree, we'll still have like a much larger number of these examples compared to examples where we were able to solve the original goal. However, one problem that we will hit here if we do this, is that most branches or most forward actions, uh, starting from naive search, will prove very trivial facts. So, so um, this is not a very efficient um, process for collecting training data if I'm doing this uh, kind of at random. So for example, um, facts like zero equals zero, x equals x, x plus zero equals x, and, and so on. Uh, those will appear a lot of times in the, in the search tree. So one, one question here is like, how, how, how can you find interesting facts to train on? Because random mathematical facts are not interesting and, and don't have the, the structure from the axioms that we want to, to elicit. And one idea that we've been exploring from reinforcement learning is the idea to reward surprisal. So reinforcement learning, this exploration problem has been very widely studied in, in a lot of settings. And one idea that has being particularly successful in, in hard exploration problems is to reward finding surprising uh, new states. Intrinsic motivation is another name. And here we can define a, a surprise or measure of having proven a goal G starting from a hypothesis, a set of hypothesis H by the log probability assigned by a language model to a string that says exactly that. I was able to prove, starting from H, I was able to prove G. Um, there's a square here, but it's just a heuristic actually. And so what we do here is we'll um, launch our MCTS search that gives us a tree with a lot of facts that are proven given some starting hypothesis. And I'll train a language model on, on strings that represent that and then repeat. So this P of LM will basically be an autoregressive transformer that's been trained uh, on, on that kind of data. and Interestingly enough, this approach to theorem proving is, is not monotonically improving in, a, in the sense that after it has proven a theorem, the theorem stops being interesting. So that the path that led to the theorem stops being surprising. And then often um, 
the agent will be less rewarded to revisiting them. Uh, so here we will we'll stop if we end up proving here. Um, yeah, so as a preliminary experiment, what if we just re replace our reward signal from I solved the problem to the surprise of, of, of what I was able to prove? So the intuition is that if we start with some initial hypothesis and, and definitions, uh, we're, we're trying to find what is unique that follows from those hypotheses and, and definitions. So like a, a trivial fact like zero equals zero, for example, can be proven starting from any state from in the natural number game. Um, but maybe if I start with a specific set of, of, of objects, I'm able to prove things that are more unique. And hopefully that will be captured by the perplexity of, of the language model that's seeing these facts. And surprisingly, maybe <laughs> if we just do this, um, this iteration of running MCTS with starting from using this uh, perplexity as a reward, then fitting on that data and repeating, we in this setting prove more theorems than if we actually try to prove the original theorems with expert iteration, which only sees reward when it's it's able to prove a subgoal. Can you give examples of what, what kind of theorems can be proved in this setting? Yes, I'll give an example in just a couple of slides. Um, yeah, so this this is just a pre preliminary experience, uh, experiment. It might still improve from, for example, doing hand side replay, um, expert iteration on top of, of that and so on. Um, but I think it's, 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 it's starting to be a promising you know, approach. And just as, as an example, this is one level from the game that this curiosity prover is the only one from from the others that, that is able to find it. And it's proving that um, the successor function on the, like if you're adding basically, you can also ask your favorite GPT-4 to translate that into English and it does uh, so really well. So, so basically the, the theorem is that you have A plus one plus B that's equal to A plus B plus one associated in this way and use that to then prove um, associativity of addition. And yeah, basically because the, the piano axiom is on the other side, uh, defining addition, like it defines from one side and then it proves that it, it also holds if you put the success from the other side. Um, yeah, so this is not a, like a particularly deep theorem about the natural numbers, but from for a primary starting from scratch, it's so quite subtle to find this in, in search, right? Like it, it needs induction you know, on the right variable, has a base case and an inductive case. Um, which are somewhat intricate. And um, like if, if you were to do this by hand, it would take a little bit of time. Um, yeah, so, and the, the other thing is, of course, the proof is formatted in this way with keywords and whatnot, but the agent is just choosing actions. It doesn't have, actually have to write uh, the proof in this way. Right? It doesn't have to learn syntax or whatnot. Um, yeah, and just to illustrate what is happening under the hood or with a surprise signal, we'll look at one case here where this prover fails, but still learn something interesting about the with a surprise signal. So this is uh, a, the, the goal here is to prove associativity of addition that builds on the previous proof. And the in this case, the the this surprise signal actually fails in the base case, which should be the easiest. Um, and a, a human written solution is, is this one. Um, of course, you have to do induction on the right variable, but like that, multiple possible base cases. Um, so when, when we look at surprisal here, the surprisal is the log probability of the string um, as measured by the, the language model. And that decomposes into the log probability of each of the characters. So we can look at you know, taking each of these facts from the solution, for example, we can look at at which points is the language model surprised to see that variable there, for example. And at first, if you just uh, run this procedure on this one problem, all the characters will be surprised because the language model has no prior on what comes after one. Right? But after we train on the first um, iteration, which doesn't prove the theorem and especially doesn't find the third and fourth uh, facts here. Um, we see that some specific characters in 
in the these facts that appear in the solutions uh, still have high perplexity if, if we compare it. But, but at the same time, the, the language model does very quickly learn syntax in the sense that it's not surprised by um, like the equality signal, for example, or where the parentheses go and so on. That stops being um, having high perplexity quite quickly. But at the same time, if you look at the distractor facts, which are hopefully trivial facts that the language model shouldn't be interested in, for example, all the variations of x plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 equals x. Um, if you were doing exact matches for as a, a, a measure of, of novelty, all of these strings would be novel right? because you can form like a combinatorial set of them. Um, but hopefully, by training a language model to recognize those, uh, it will generalize to understand that after it has seen enough x plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 equals x, other facts that are variations of that shouldn't be surprising. And we do see this um, mostly happening for, for, for these facts. Um, like a lot of these come from much, come much beyond the screen here. Um, and even though they are very long strings, they end up having lower perplexity than even the short facts that appear in the solution. So this, this does seem, yeah, we're still trying to understand exactly what it is. Uh, yeah, uh, can, I, can I just understand what you're doing and see if I'm saying it right? So yeah. you're, you're trying to generate proofs basically by language model completion. It, it, it doesn't always prove the original goal, but when it proves a G prime, that's a new proof, as you said, right. you could have, but now you filter those by the surprise hole and you say, we're going to add it to the training set if it was a new valid proof, which was surprising. Is that, is that the idea? Or, or yeah, you know? yeah. so in, in this particular experiment, we're running search yeah. where instead of the reward being, I was able to solve the problem, at each node, you get a reward that's basically the surprise of the language model uh, for being able to prove that. that well, when part. you say search, you're directing, I mean, you're not just generating with the language model. So the, the, the search comes in how? Yeah, so the search is in the, the actual space that Piano defines. So I start with the theorem statement, and then I can pick like the apply induction. The okay. Uh, uh, okay. So so, yeah. so it's not it's, it's so the role of the language models not to find the proofs. Piano is finding the proofs. Yeah. So and... piano defines the space. The so language yeah. model scores which branches it wants to to explore the most. And it's, it's serving like as the value function basically. Okay. So so, so the language models the value function. Right. Piano. Implements, you know, steps, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. symbolic. It's right. it's, it's right. verifying the proofs, and the point where the surprisal now comes in mm -hmm. is that you're really just letting the language model instead of judging something else. It's just judging how surprised it was. Exactly, and then yeah. that, that 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 you're you're favoring, and you're not you're not doing always the greedy search, right? You're, yeah, you're, exactly. Yeah, okay, uh, okay, I see. Hmm. Yeah. So one one. Question here is if you're just trying to find interesting consequences of the hypothesis, do you end up proving the, the original theorem, even if that was not the goal? Um, and in some cases, uh, that seems to be the case. Well, well I guess you, you could ask whether it's the surprise of directing it or it's just broadening, it's making sure that it explores the whole space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The thing is, yeah, so what this is showing is that it's broadening in a way that. It, seems promising in the sense that it's not interested in trivial facts that are kind of minor variations of, because there are like millions of those, right? Like, um, like reassociations of zero plus zero equals X, for example, things like that. Zero plus zero plus zero plus X equals X. Um, but also, so it's, so it's, so it's better to think of as constraining the search space yeah, towards yeah. more promising right, directions. Right, yeah. okay. yeah. So comparing the surprise as a as it is evolving in this process, you see that like at first, it's basically the longer strings are more surprising because language one has little prior over anything really. Um, but after training this, in, in this case, we're looking at the the specific steps in the solution to that to the base case to, to associate it. It does seem like surprise uh, starts to differentiate between those steps and. Kind of these trivial distractors that are nonetheless new. Um, yeah, so there's still a lot of ongoing ideas here to, to explore. So, for example, right now the language model is being used to score surprisal. We can, of course, also train an exploration policy based on that, like a policy that will try to 
to maximize the uh, surprise. Um, and then that's collecting a lot of training data that it can leverage for hand side replay. And from reinforcement learning, there are a lot of other ideas of exploration signals and ways to do this. Um, yeah, but just to summarize, this is an attempt to set up a, a game of math where we can kind of just start to learn from sort of the rules of the game. Um, the fact that we use a dependent type theory here, um, I, I think should make it, at least in principle, easy to, to translate, especially because I'm using a very small um, subset of like, and to have inductive types, for example. Um, so it should not be hard to translate the proof objects between systems after we find them. And, and it's also, I think, interesting that we start to be able to measure things more than correctness, right? which is often secondary in math. Like it's easy to generate correct facts that are not interesting. And a lot of, um, and there are examples of the, the converse as well. And I think this curiosity and surprise of signal might, might allow for a lot of rich interactions between a mathematician and, and an expert uh, automated prover. And like, for example, the agent might be able to say, okay, here's something unexpected that I was able to prove using the surprise of it, because like this follows from these hypotheses. Um, or maybe the converse, like here's something that I think wouldn't be surprising at all, should be trivial, but I can't prove it. So maybe that says something. Maybe maybe the axioms don't, don't really um, express what they wanted in their case. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Oh, thank you, very, very interesting. Uh, questions? Anybody? Yeah. Well, can you talk a little bit more about how the scoring works, um, how the LLM or the model um, evaluates like, how, how surprising uh, the given the proof state is that we um, yeah, so um, so a language model, uh, another regressive language model is really a distribution over sentences, right. over strings. Really. And at each point, you can look at the, like if I have a, a given string, I can look at the, for example, the, the probability that the model is assigning for the oh, first character right. and then the second character condition on the first right. one. Right. So, okay. Questions? Oh, I'll ask. So, I mean, you, so you, we, the, the surprisal is, you know, playing various roles and it's constraining towards uh, more potentially more valuable uh, mm -hmm. directions in the search space. But, but then you made the comment earlier that, in fact, you're non monotonic and because of the yeah, surprisal, yeah. you can get worse. You can start to think that mm -hmm. the straightforward answer isn't good enough. Right, and we should be right. doing something else. So, Presumably, there has to be some other balance, some other factor in the uh, in the in the score. That uh, uh, okay, so that that's uh, I guess an open question. But yeah, yeah, I, I think that's yeah. This idea of trying trying to prove a theorem without trying to prove the theorem is more of a thought experiment in the sense that, like, for maximum performance, you should really learn from the experience that you had in a go-conditioned way and then try to go to the goal. Um, yeah, so, so basically, like, I think this non-monotonicity is just because of the this objective not being proving the theorem, but rather just finding surprising things. But we could then get the data and train a go-directed prover that would be monotonic. That's it. No questions? Could, could you say a little more, more about uh, earlier in the talk, this anti-unification, this way that you were yeah. generalizing? Yeah, so this is this is also like a classical idea that had a number of instantiations. The one that we do here is particularly simple because, so basically we, we can treat these, um, yeah, we can treat solutions like the one on the, on the left and on the right here as these sequences of actions with parameters. And to anti-unify is basically to try to come up with a more general, um, like a more general, in this case, a tactic that if I replace it with the right parameters would actually put uh, 
would reconstruct both the the solutions that it's coming from. Um, so it's it's in, in this case the algorithm is is very simple. Like I basically look for segments of the same length that apply the same axioms, and then see if there is a way to solve the the equations that the parameters make, basically. Yeah, Richard? So I have a question. When you add, when you add to your, or you add tactics to your, to your system, mm -hmm. the policy needs to know about the, needs to know about the tactic in order to use them effectively. Yeah. So do you bootstrap this in some ways? Like do you, do you, um, do you learn, how do you learn on the tactics as well? Do you do it step by step at each level? Yeah, that's a good question. So in this case, because we induce the tactics from existing solutions, um, rewriting those solutions in terms of the, the new tactic gives us some training data to, to bootstrap the policy. So basically, so for example, here the policy found that solution without the tactic. But then we replaced, like we put the tactic there and then train it on the data of like, oh, if you were to solve this problem again, you should actually call this tactic instead of the, of the axiom. More questions? Okay, uh, if not, uh, let's again thank uh, Gabriel for a very uh, stimulating and uh, interesting and that interesting talk. And uh, so uh, next week we'll have uh, Abhishek uh, Panigrahi, he will speak about the uh, power of uh, transformer forward pass models. And I look forward to seeing you all there. Bye.